and writing a proof. But they, um, on one hand, they should feel very doable because you're just taking the existing Cayley table. And if you want to keep it uniform so that everybody's Cayley table looks the same so you're able to talk to each other, I'll post a Cayley table online for using the R and the R1 that's uniform and standardized so that when you're working with each other, you everybody has the same things. So otherwise, if one person has their R2 in a different spot than the other person, it's going to look different. So let's generalize some of the concepts of DN. And again, the whole purpose here is that you just don't want to keep building this thing from scratch every time you have a bigger and bigger polygon. Well, I could take and define all the rotations, not just three. I could say if I have an n gone, then these r0 to rn minus 1 would be all the rotations of dn, where n is the n gone, and ri is of a counterclockwise rotation. And then I could define an angle. And you should start to feel like um, Dr. Song has entered the class. Right, you're rotating. Should we call him? I think he's somewhere here. Call him. Can you make a cameo? Okay, so you can take a, the theta to be the rotation angle, and that rotation angle will change depending on what your n-gon looks like. Right? If you had the square, d4, what would that angle be every time you rotate? I went to too many metal concerts. <laughs> can't hear. What would you say? That's right. Counter. So, right. So um, you can actually figure out what that angle would be for a specific n gon. And i would be the number of rotations of the angle. So you're actually taking all the way around and chopping it by exactly n to get this. Theta is the angle for one vertex to meet the next. You can think of it that way too. So we know from the grand poobah of linear algebra <laughs> that there's actually a matrix that gives you that. Right? Do you remember this? Probably in this room, right? Next door. <laughs> so I can tell him that his class remembers that you had matrices like this. So if you wanted to rotate by a particular angle, you just multiply a particular vector, a position, you would multiply by this matrix. Recall that? So linear algebra makes an entrance. We always talk about <coughs> linear algebra. It's really interesting to hear a department talk about linear algebra because people who are doing analysis-based things think of linear algebra as being a numerical kind of scheme, numerical linear algebra. You're using it to achieve something. So you, they're thinking differential equations. But people who are in, into algebra, they hear linear algebra. They hear the algebra side of it. So here, making an entrance into, linear, into abstract algebra class. They're very, very related. So if I define R to be the reflection of the n-gon around the line through the vertex 1, so I can always position my n-gon like I did in that diagram where the 1 is at the top. Right? I can always make 1 to be the top 1. And if I put a line through that vertex 1 in the origin, like I, I took a pentagon for you to see what that would look like. So if I took and dropped the line right through 1 and dropped it down to the origin, then little r, the reflection, can be represented by this matrix. And you should know that not just from Dr. Song, but you should know that from undergraduate algebra, um, linear algebra. I think they probably talk about reflections and rotations three quarters of the way into the class. So what is the order of R? R recall R is the first R1, the first reflection. The first reflection you get. So in this case, R1 would be the reflection around this, this thing right here. What would the order of R be, this little r? By the way, you can do all of this with matrices now. That's what the cool thing is about matrices. When you do that first reflection, it doesn't matter what n you're in. It's always going to be that matrix. Reflection right around the, right? So how do you calculate an order? There's two ways to calculate an order. You can go and count, which goes to take powers, right? And everybody in here knows how to multiply matrices, right? If you don't, your calculator does. Hint, hint. <laughs> so here you can, instead of putting E being the identity, getting it, the shape back to it, you can think of E being the identity matrix. So take powers of your guy and see when it comes back to the identity matrix. That's pretty cool. So uh, I think only Michael had Galleon, right? 
but it's really cool to see like there's a because if you look at the way Galleon talks about dihedral groups there looks like there's absolutely no connection to linear algebra it's a beautiful two more questions so what I'm having you do instead of looking at the the three I'm you, having you use these these matrices and generalize what you're seeing for the n-gon. The whole purpose is that no one, nobody can ask you to do the 16 by 16 one because you now have a trick. All thanks to Dr. Song. Am I only, the only one excited up here? I did the writing already. I, actually, writing on the tablet, some of you have asked me about using the tablet in your class. It takes a while to figure out how to write because the tap, the, I don't know if anybody's ever used a stylus. It sometimes doesn't do what you want to do. It's like playing Pac-Man and you move the joystick and the jo you're moving the joystick and the Pac-Man's going wherever it wants to go, something like that. So it takes a long time actually to draft it up. And that's not my real writing with a pen, regular pen. This looks different when you write on the tablet somehow. I think, Robert, when you had me a long time ago, it looked like a spider wrote it because it was so difficult for me to figure out how to get the right thickness of the pen and everything to make it work. <laughs> it was like really thin and I couldn't figure it out. Part, I'm a little confused on homework B. Mm -hmm. How is any reflection going, or any rotation going to equal reflection? Is that supposed to be never true or am I just confused? No, just try it out and see what happens. Play around with it. I just copied the question out of the book, so I, I, I also was stuck, struck with it, but let's see what we, we do when we actually calculate these things. Um, little r here is just a general... First reflection, so if you take your n-gon, no matter what the n-gon looks like, and drop it, drop it down like this guy. Right, so it's always going to be that one. So I do think that when you take it to a power, you're going to get it equal to a ro uh, reflection, a rotation. I, I'm, I don't see how I'd ever get point two clockwise from point one just by... Yeah, I didn't see it either. So I, I wrote it down and I thought, okay, I'm going to scratch it out with you guys and see. Professor, the uh, reflections have to go through the vertices, right? Yes. Because yeah. you have lines so one up and then one through... Oh, I put it on a coordinate axis because I'm talking about the origin. So if I'm talking about the origin, I need some reference point. Right. And I'm wondering, because you have big R, so is that one? That's the first rotation, right. So see what happens when you take the first rotation to powers. Just look and see what happens. So I thought that too, but I thought I haven't played with it yet. So I'm going to believe what they're, say they're saying in the homework problem and then One thing you can be assured of is I do all the homework too. I think it's fun. <laughs> Not only that, I really hate when Jillian Michaels is standing there saying, come on, do it, and she's monologuing and you're doing push-ups, and like, she's forgotten about me, and she's just yapping up there. She should do it too. <laughs> she should do it just like, I like the exercise instructors that do it with you. Feel my pain with me. <laughs> And I'm more willing to, to actually do it. So I do all your homework. And it's fun. So if you set R1 to R, because I don't need R1 anymore. I don't need a subscript. There's only one. So once you do these little exercises, see if you can give a verbal explanation why you can characterize entire of dn in just the rotation, the first rotation, and the first reflection in this way, that you're going to get all of them. And with all the little exercises, starting out with D3 and moving forward, you're, it's going to come clear once you keep playing around, like, this is what's happening. So do them in order. Give yourself some time. It's not like a proof where you have to write it down and think about it and get the no and get the show and, you know, keep mulling over it. You do have to actually sit and do it, but give yourself some time to walk through it, like an exercise a day, so you can actually see the whole story unfolding in front of you. 
Um, when you get to the end, this is what you should be finding. Um, if you can get to this and you can understand why you get to this, we have now a nice way of characterizing dn. So now if I gave you find me all symmetries of d8, you won't hate me. You can actually write this out. Well, maybe you will, but I don't think you'll hate me as much. You can just write this out. Um, then the second one, you can actually show that second piece by using the matrix representations. We have matrix representation. We can multiply matrices. That's cool. Composition is going to be the same thing as multiplying matrices. That's what you learned from uh, Dr. Song. These rotations and reflections turn out to be matrix multiplications. And then finally, um, show this last piece, number three, for homework, that R times R inverse, not hard to do, because R inverse, you can actually characterize which one is R inverse, which brings you back to R, and then show by matrix multiplication that these two things are equal. And that's really important, because that won't happen if the group was abelian. This would not happen. So this means the group is non-abelian. So all of these proofs that you get in Galleon show that it's non-abelian for a DN. All with this characterization is pretty easy. You write down this thing and you say, okay, this is true. This can't be true. And I'll show you in a second why that's true. So that's the punchline, that this is also not an abelian group, which is really interesting because it's a finite group. It's not abelian. You can find a finite group that's not abelian of order 2n. There it is. You have a lot of examples to work with. Now, in the homework that you had to do for the exam, you saw that it's this, having the cyclic groups as an example and having the four Klein groups as an example gives you something to, to think about as you're moving forward. Now you have a whole wealth of examples to think about that you, know, you can use as something in your mind when they say, is this true or is this not true? So why is that punchline that right here? Why is it not abelian? Well, um, there's a nice homework problem. It was, I didn't assign it earlier, but I am assigning it now. It's super easy, actually, that if a group is abelian, then AB raised to the negative 1 is A inverse B inverse, and vice versa. If all the elements have this property, AB inverse is A inverse B inverse, then the group is abelian. It's one and the same. And in the dihedral group, that's not true because of that last number three that I have on the previous section. So that tells you that dn for no n is going to be abelian. Now th those exercises that you're doing, they're not going to be, each one itself is not going to be time consuming. It's computation. You're just taking matrices and multiplying them. So I think everybody in here can multiply two by two matrices. We'll be okay. Maybe this one will, you have to structure it as a proof, so that one will be more. It, it won't be too bad, though. On the scale of things we've already done, that's not too bad. Okay, any questions? 